The rainy season in East Africa lasts for only a few weeks. And from the time the last drop of rain falls, the sun comes out again and the land starts to dry out. By the end of a long dry season, the earth looks like the surface of some distant hostile planet. But it still supports abundant life, a variety of creatures, great and small, who somehow manage to cope, who have evolved many and different ways to get through that long, hot season in the sun. For the grazing animals, the African summer comes all too quickly. The lush pastures wither and soon turn to gold. For everybody, food becomes more and more difficult to find. For the elephant and the tortoise, the buffalo and the mouse. Water holes, rivers and even lakes dry up. For those who come to drink, it means great hardship. For those who live in water, the frogs, fish, and even the hippo, it can mean disaster. This is the story of just a few of those creatures. How their lives are affected by the drying up of the land and how they manage to survive through dry season and drought until the rains come again. Around the water's edge, this year's crop of young frogs are coming ashore for the first time, unaware of the land's many dangers. For the non-poisonous green snake, the froglets are easy pickings. The snake is attracted by movement, no matter how tiny. But there are frogs, and there are bullfrogs. And frogs, too, are attracted by movement. Fifteen minutes, and about eighteen inches later, a snake full of frogs is now a frog full of snake. All frogs feed voraciously in the rains to lay on fat, 
And before the earth hardens in the sun, they make their preparations for the dry season. The pixie toad, a relative of the bullfrog, fills its belly and bladder with water, then digs down a foot or more and hollows out a tight-fitting cell. Except that it goes head first, the burrowing toad does the same thing. Once in its underground cell, it coats its skin with mucus, which hardens like lacquer, sealing in moisture as effectively as a polythene bag. It then slows down its respiration and heartbeat, and will spend the dry season in a state of suspended animation called estivation, or summer sleep. Tree frogs also estivate, but above ground. On the underside of an evergreen leaf, the small green tree frog tucks in its legs to reduce the exposed surface, and there it will pass the dry season, protected from dehydration by the lacquer, which makes its skin almost completely watertight. The great grey tree frog is so efficient at retaining moisture that it can estivate right out in the open. It turns chalk white to reflect the heat, but by the time the rain comes again, it may have lost half its body weight. The tortoise spends its summer sleep in a clump of bushes, where it can expect constant shade. Snails burrow underground, and there close off their shell with a watertight seal to keep from drying out. And the four-foot monitor lizard slides down into the chimney of a termite mound. So before the earth has baked hard, most of the reptiles and amphibians have dropped out and switched off, ready to slumber their way through the dry and difficult days ahead. The water holes shrink, consumed by sun and wind and countless tiny sips. The frogs have left, but the fish must stay. These are killifish. The two-inch long male is displaying to a prospective mate. As the level drops and the water becomes warmer and murkier, the fish fight, display, and mate as if there were no tomorrow. And for most of them, there is no tomorrow. Before long, only a few elephant footprints hold a little water and a lot of fish. They jump desperately because of the heat and perhaps because occasionally one may land in a deeper permanent pool. Within hours, all of them will be dead in the mud. This wildebeest was trying to drink from the middle of a drying swamp when she got stuck. Thin and weak from poor grazing, she is exhausted by the struggle, which went on for nearly three hours.
Many water holes are no more than mud puddles now. Forced to drink side by side, the heavyweights come to an uneasy truce. There are fish in these puddles too. Extraordinary creatures that have not changed for 350 million years. Lungfish. The lungfish is a relic of the Devonian period, when the waters of the earth were soupy with rotting vegetation and so low in oxygen that the only way a fish could survive was to develop primitive lungs and come to the surface to gulp extra air. In time, this enabled the lungfish to evolve a unique way of surviving when left high and dry. As well as being able to breathe out of water, it can also move across dry land in search of deeper pools. As the last puddle dries out, the lungfish buries itself in the mud and there, like the frogs, it will go to sleep. As it reverses down into the mud, it blows bubbles so that an air tube is kept open to breathe through. The fish will then curl up and encase itself in a layer of mucus, which dries into a parchment-like cocoon and keeps the fish moist. With all functions slowed down, it can, if necessary, sleep for up to two years, awaiting the rains. The grass is the colour of mud now, still nutritious, but highly combustible. Once grass fires were infrequent events, started perhaps by lightning. Now they are mostly caused by man. They are seldom a danger to the larger animals, who simply walk around them, or if the flames aren't too big, jump over them. Some animals take advantage of the fires, like this baboon catching locusts as they flee the flames. But the smaller, slow-moving creatures do suffer as fire sweeps through their hiding places. This tortoise was heading for a bare patch of ground where another has already found refuge. It's overtaken. But if the flames pass quickly enough and the grass is not too dense, it will survive.
Thousands of tons of grass covering hundreds of square miles may go up in flames, and countless tiny lives are lost. Great flocks of storks, guided by the pillars of smoke, come dropping in for a feast. They hunt both sides of the flames. Some work the smoky side, catching snakes, mice or insects as they flee. Others cover the fresh burn, picking up the dead or disabled. Walking over the burn can be painful, and sometimes a bird has to literally hot-foot it away. The winds often change at night, and by morning the fire has burnt itself out. Already among the ashes, life is returning. Emerging from their hiding places, spiders festoon the grass with a vast cat's cradle of shiny strands. All the grassland creatures are now in a strange situation. Their colouring, evolved as camouflage in the tawny grass, is useless now. But it's the same for hunter and hunted alike. The dick dick, which knew every clump of grass and hiding place in its territory, has no concealment. But nor has the cheetah, so for them, nature's precarious balance is little changed. But the slow-moving creatures, who take a while to find new hiding places, are very vulnerable. So for the scavengers, if for no one else, this is a time of plenty. The large mammals are running out of food, but the dropouts are doing fine. On evergreen and inedible bushes like this one, tiny green tree frogs are asleep and well, requiring neither food nor water. The great grey tree frog has lost a little weight, but is safe on her sunny perch.
below the fractured earth, the snails, the frogs, and the lungfish wait in their deep summer sleep. Their hearts scarcely beating, their lungs scarcely breathing, their blood pressure way down, their kidneys switched off. Each enclosed in a tiny moist time capsule, they sleep through it all for months or years if necessary, waiting for the return of the waters. Above ground, the dust and smoke in the air make for a spectacular sunrise. But until the rains come, every new day belongs only to the vultures. In the dry season, everyone must scratch for a living. And small birds follow the guinea fowl to snatch up stray seeds. Incredibly, there is one bird that chooses to nest in these conditions. Perfectly camouflaged among the burnt grass, the yellow-throated sand grouse sits on her eggs. Morning and evening she leaves her nest and together with her mate she flies off to the nearest water to drink. When they have eggs, both birds quickly drink and then return to the nest. But once the chicks have hatched, the male does a strange thing. Whilst drinking, he wades in and dips his belly one or more times into the water. Ordinary feathers are designed to repel water. So a fallen one floats lightly on the surface. But on his belly, the male sand grouse has a patch of special feathers which absorb water like a sponge. They are covered in fine hairs which swell and quickly become waterlogged. birds fly back to the nest, which may be many miles away, as directly as possible to minimize evaporation. With the female leading the way, they hurry to the waiting chicks, who have been lying motionless in the grass, relying on their camouflage to protect them. Then, like so many eager puppies trying to suckle, the chicks bury their beaks in the male's belly feathers and drink. Strangely, the female does not have these special feathers. 
Only the male has this unique adaptation which enables the sand grouse to raise their young in the most inhospitable country and at what would appear to be the worst possible time of year. Among the clumps of dry grass is the tiny burrow of the pygmy mouse, a creature small enough to easily sit in a teaspoon. One of its native names is the pebble herdsman, from its habit of piling small stones at the entrance to its burrow. The mouse forages for the few seeds it needs to keep alive and then goes back underground before the night gets too chilly. It doesn't use the stones to close the burrow, they are simply arranged across the entrance. There seems to be no explanation until the bitter cold hours before dawn work their magic. The stones are placed at the interface of the cold night air and the warm moist air of the burrow. Dew forms on the pebbles and at dawn the pygmy mouse emerges for a pygmy sized drink. This handsome antelope, the fringiered oryx, does not need to drink at all, as long as it can find some relatively moist food. One way it does this is by digging up potato-like tubers that contain a high percentage of water. How it locates them deep below the surface is not known, but find them it does, so freeing itself from the long trek in search of water. For the elephants, who must have water, and lots of it, there is no escape from that endless search. An old cow leads her family along a dry river bed to a place where she knows they will find water below the surface. For centuries, elephants have drunk at these places, where they dig deep holes down to the water table and wait patiently for a trunkful to seep slowly through the sand. The first trunk load is often full of sand and mud, but they are as fastidious as they are thirsty, so it is squirted away. It takes several hours for a herd to drink, and the traffic around the wells goes on non-stop, day and night. Many other creatures drink at the elephant wells, including rhino, although their horns can make it extremely difficult to reach water. The elephants can now go for several days before they need to drink again and can travel many miles searching for food. But the rhino is limited to a small area within reach of water.
The vegetation around the water hole is heavily browsed and trampled by all the visiting animals. So when dry season lengthens into drought, the rhino is the first of the large animals to die. Not of thirst, but of hunger. Among the dry branches is a tiny touch of green. A vine snake watches for movement in the seemingly lifeless bush. The great grey tree frog must not jump. If it does, there is a chance it will escape the snake, but exposing its legs and belly to the baking air would bring dehydration and death within hours. In the heat, the tree frog plays it cool. Every ten years or so, East Africa is hit by a major drought. The hardships of a normal dry season are magnified, and many creatures are overwhelmed. A baby elephant is dying, and the herd cows try to help it. Its mother has little milk, and the youngster cannot digest the dry grass and sticks, which is all that's left to eat. For four hours, the herd stands over the youngster. Then, driven by thirst and hunger, they move on. The mother Torn between her own terrible thirst, the companionship of her family group, and the need to comfort her dying calf, hesitates, then makes the decision we would expect of an elephant. The drought is tightening its grip. Even lakes are drying up now, and the treacly shore becomes a treacherous trap for the thirsty. In pools of mud around the lake shore, hippos gather in pathetic huddles. The last remaining water is at the mouth of a river that once flowed into the lake. And in this one pool, all the lake's giant catfish have gathered.
Like the lungfish, catfish can gulp air, so they survive in this mud even though it can have no oxygen. But unlike the safely buried lungfish, they will die if the mud dries out. And then they are joined by the hippos. Over the next few days, some 600 hippos collect in the pool. There is even one born into this desperate society. There is very little fighting, but as the pool dries up, the animals jostle for space in the wettest areas. Without water to cover them, the hippos suffer terribly from the sun and heat exhaustion. Soon, pink with sunburn and too tired to struggle, the hippos can only sit and wait under an unpromising sky. For all its harshness, the dry season is a necessary interlude, a process of elimination, a time of testing, when a species is refined and distilled, when any creature below standard must fall by the wayside. The year is coming full circle. The healing procession of the seasons goes on, bringing endless change and constant renewal. And so, eventually, the rains come. Gently at first, like a requiem, with gauzy veils and soft tears upon the waiting earth. But the mood will soon change to celebration, and as the rain soaks in, the earth itself seems to come awake. Deep below ground, kissed awake by the Princess of Rain, 
the dry husk of a bullfrog swells and splits his old skin, and then spoils his princely image by eating it. A meager breakfast after a very long night. Can simple animals like these rejoice? Seeing them when the rains first come, it's tempting to believe that they can. And as night falls over the flooded land, the frogs certainly appear to do so. racket is, of course, to find a mate. And in the noise and excitement, quite a few mistakes are made. Boy needs boy, and suitable offence is taken. The great grey tree frogs, plump again after months of baking sun, begin their elaborate spawning process. Exuding mucus, the female beats it into a foam with her hind legs, making sure it's well stuck onto the branch. Now she lays two or three hundred eggs into the mass of foam and the male fertilizes them whilst helping with the mixing. Other pairs soon join in. So do unattached males, sometimes up to six or seven of them. It's probably as close as nature comes to a Roman orgy, California style, and it goes on for most of the night. Dawn finds a solitary female putting the finishing touches to her nest, which she now leaves to take its chances with nature. The burrowing toad has found a mate in the night, and she drags him off to her underground cave. A few inches down, the female lays about 200 eggs in a capsule of jelly, and there, in contrast to the foam frog, she carefully guards them. The outer surface of the foam nest hardens to a crust in the sun, and inside the eggs start to ripen. A few days later, the burrowing toad's eggs hatch, and the tadpoles wriggle up onto the mother's body. Another two days pass. 
Meanwhile, the toad has dug a tunnel to the water's edge, and now the tadpoles wriggle down this tunnel to the water. The tree frog eggs have hatched, and the tadpoles wriggle violently to liquefy the foam. When it is watery enough, the crust will dissolve, and the tadpoles will drip out of the bottom of the nest. burrowing toad and the tree frog. Two totally different ways of getting through the dry season and totally different ways of breathing when the rains finally come. And then there's the most incredible sleeper of them all. For months the lungfish has been immobile but now as the water seeps down, it starts to struggle upwards. It will take many hours before this entombed, air-breathing creature emerges to live like a proper fish once more. The bush is a blaze of colour now, clashing colours that only Africa could wear. The commonest flower is the white morning glory creeper which wraps the broken bushes like fresh bandages, covering the wounds of the dry season. Animals as long-lived as elephants will see many dry seasons and several major droughts. For them, the rains are a time to eat and get back into good condition. For the smaller creatures, the command is to eat and to mate. And this old lady manages both at once. If any one animal symbolizes the urgency and vigor of the rainy season, it is the killifish, those exquisite creatures we last saw dying in a mud puddle. For killifish, 
are annuals. Before those fish died, they laid eggs in the mud, which hatched as soon as they were covered with water again. The fish grow rapidly and spend their short lives displaying, courting, and making sure enough eggs are laid that these dull puddles will always have a touch of fire. The eggs are laid singly, pushed into the mud by a stabbing action of the female's anal fin. The eggs can live for years in the dried mud, waiting for the next rains. The fish themselves live but a few months. They never have the chance to grow old. How pleasing to we humans that this gorgeous, active creature should live a short life in which energy never flags and beauty never fades. A hippo and its mate leave their lake and set out across the shimmering plains. This is the imperative that comes with the rains. Those who have survived the drought must use this brief time of plenty to consolidate their position and pass on their successful genes. For the elephants, it is a time to rebuild their strength. For the mouse, the tortoise and the frogs, a time to mate. For the lungfish to spawn another generation whose forebears have defied droughts for over 300 million years. For the killifish, the rainy season is a lifetime. For the hippo, an opportunity to search for a new lake. Perhaps one that next time will not dry out. But whatever the creature, and whatever it is they must do while the earth is green, they must not delay. For the rainy season in East Africa lasts for only a few weeks. And from the time the last drop of rain falls, the sun comes out again. The land starts to dry out. And so begins another season in the sun. <laughs>